okay? And um, you're all very welcome to, uh, well, I was going to say positive nights. So it's been the Buddha bag, it's uh, positive nights, and today it's positive Sundays we're going with today. Because um, we have Martin uh, to do uh, this chat with us. We've had several conversations with Martin over the years. My most recent one was at the Electric Picnic, and uh, we had great fun there that day, talking about psychedelics. Um, so Martin, you're very, very welcome. Before we begin, I'm just gonna ask people to join us. We'll just do a short kind of centering meditation, um, which takes us about just about five minutes to center ourselves. So I invite you all to um, close your eyes, get comfortable in your body, and drop into your heart center. And take a couple of breaths into your heart center. And really feel your body relaxing. Really feel your body grounding. And feel your heart connecting and feel your mind kind of dropping out. So you're moving to this space, this heart connection space, where we're moving from a, the language of thinking to the language of feeling. And when you step into this space of feeling, let go of the noise of the mind, let go of judgment, let go of any need to have an opinion on anything for the moment and just feel into what's right and let go of the rest. Feel into what resonates to you and let go of the rest. Now feel yourself breathe into that heart center again. And on the out breath, just feel a real relaxation coming into your body. And before you open your eyes, just to stay in that heart connected space as we have our conversation this afternoon. And as I said, again, whatever you hear today that resonates, take that away and just simply let go of the rest. No need to go into judgment, stay in feeling. So as you open your eyes, you're all very welcome. As I said, uh, this is an event for Positive Life and we're hosting our events like everybody is now on Zoom. And uh, they're going really, really well. We're enjoying them. We're getting to talk to amazing people. And a guest that, as I said, I've had Martin Duffy speak with us probably four or five times over the years, it's been terrific events. He's a wealth of knowledge, uh, highly respected in Ireland in the uh, whole holistic area. And Dunderry Park is a wonderful uh, space that he's created. So thank you, Martin, and delighted to have you here today. You're very, very welcome. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having us again. I uh, always enjoy buzzing with you on these things, and I'm looking forward to today. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, Martin, I think I'm going to start right at the top. We're, we're going to talk about this course that you've set up and is beginning in January. And um, But the first thing I want to talk to you about is the old favorite, and that is shamanism. Mm. And uh, let's bring it right up to date. What do you feel the role of shamanism is with the current situation that we have going on in the world right now? What role, what significance can shamanism play within that framework, do you feel? Yeah, that's a good question, Paul, because 
a lot of the people who've worked with me over the years have been contacting me and emailing me and having chats on Zoom as well. And they've said the fact that they had a shamanic perspective on things made a huge difference to them at this time because they were able to step outside the chaos of everyday life and connect to nature for a start, because one of the things we do at Dunderry Park is stalking awareness in nature. So it wasn't just going for a walk in nature they were doing, they were going and connecting with the trees, taking their shoes and socks off and earthing themselves, and really communing with the spirits of nature as, as they learned to do in, in the work at Dunderry. That was one side of it. Um, the other aspect of it was that they had this sense of when they needed to get help, being isolated on their own, all they had to do was put on the drumming CD, journey into the inner world, low world, upper world, or middle world, and connect with their own guides, their power animals and their guides, and get wisdom and information and help and healing directly from the source. They didn't have to wait for anybody else to be able to guide them in that regard, because have these contacts established themselves already over the years. And it was a sense of support for them and a sense of understanding help and healing, but more so, their guides were very good at giving them an overall perspective on what was going on in these time of the pandemic, which was very much true for me too. I had a lot of deep journeys, uh, particularly in the first lockdown. And I got a lot of valuable information on the more archetypal um, energies that are moving in the collective unconscious at the moment, particularly around the astrological configurations of Pluto and Saturn and Jupiter in the middle of all of that. And my guys were giving me this transpersonal perspective. And the people who I were working with um, had the same kind of um, experiences. So when, I, when you ask me that question, I say, well, it's more relevant than ever. Shamanism is a tradition going back maybe 50,000 years. I think nowadays it's more relevant than ever because we are in a danger of... You know, modern times and I think people are finding that very useful at the moment um, Martin can you just go over the last piece of what you said there because there was a little bit of interference just a small bit at the end there yeah, well, I was saying there that um, it's more, shaman is more relevant today than ever because it's ancient wisdom from modern times. Um, our ancestors in the past had a natural, normal, ordinary connection to nature and the spirit world. I think part of what's happening today is soul loss for people on an individual, uh, personal and collective level. And what shamanism does is it helps us plug back into the, into the soul nature of our being. And many people are suffering from soul loss so shamanism is a way to f have somebody, a practitioner, do a journey for you and find the part of the soul that's missing, retrieve it and bring it back in and blow it into your heart chakra and into your crown chakra, therefore uniting yourself with your vital energy again. So overall, um, in terms of you know, shamanism today, it's like it also gets us to step out of the everyday ego consciousness and see a bigger picture. Like, I mean, shamanism gets us to look at the, the earth from millions, even billions of years of evolution. And we've seen crises come and go in the past, and we'll see uh, more in the future. But when we look back through our ancestral um, kind of viewpoint and through the shamanic eyes, we see the earth always e evolves through these situations, through these crises, and it's constantly moving to a higher level of vibration a higher level of consciousness. And I think the shamanic perspective gives us that transpersonal view so that we're not so locked into what Alan Watts called the skin encapsulated ego, where we're, you know, just defining ourselves by what rattles around in our heads every day. When we take the shamanic journey or the shamanic perspective, we get outside that and outside of time. And then we see our lives as um, something that happens maybe over lifetimes as opposed to one lifetime. And then we see we're part of this evolutionary process of, of consciousness. And I know for me anyway, and for a lot of people who I've spoken to, that makes a difference. That means that they're not locked into a small definition of who they are themselves or 
you know, locked into a small idea of what's happening at this period in time. Brilliant. So you're talking about this ability to uh, connect with who you really are and then kind of live from there. You know, it's like, a, yeah. Yeah. it's like, it's, it's, I remember once th this thing about people saying it's an inside job, you know, it's uh, for some people that can sound a bit empty because they're like, I don't really know what's inside, you know, but when you're continually working like you are and connecting into that space, you really know that there's a strength that yeah. you can draw on. But what I wanted to ask you was about the whole area of soul loss mm. and soul retrieval. Mm. We've been kind of, I suppose, through our, through even religion as well, to believe that the soul is eternal and can never be hurt or damaged or affected by what we do here with this experience. So yeah. we see it as this immovable object almost is how I see the soul, how I think of the soul. It's like a data bank that's, that's fine with everything I'm getting up to here. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you, how, how does that take place? How does a human um, let go of an aspect of their soul? Is it something we block from the human perspective that we then have to retrieve? And from the soul's perspective, the soul, I presume, never panics about this situation. So just can you talk to me maybe about a soul retrieval that sticks out for you, an experience yeah. you had with another person that just went, wow, I've really re-establish this person's connection to their soul yes well soul loss happens it's a survival strategy really because when we go through crisis or trauma if we were fully present to the trauma at the time say childhood sexual abuse road traffic accident birth trauma whatever um we might be overwhelmed and it, we might shatter the psyche which does happen and you, you people who have severe um psychosis or or whatever might have their psyche has become shattered because it's become unbearable for them to suffer the trauma that's going on for them at that particular time. So as a survival strategy, part of the soul, um, usually the part that holds the, the sweet memories, the joyful side, the innocence, the kind of naivety, the kind of beautiful, compassionate sides of ourselves, takes off, splits away from the psyche and goes into a safe place in what we call the other world or into the dream time or into the spirit world. And often I find soul parts, um, say a young girl, a young boy had been bullied at school or abused as a child. And when I do a soul retrieval, I'll find the part, the little girl, little boy hiding in a wardrobe, or more often lately I find they went, they went literally went out the back door into the woods and, um, as they say in Ireland, went off with the fairies. Do you find them when I go there in a beautiful meadow, often sunny, the little girl or boy is there playing with the animals and they're, they're happy and they're peaceful and they're, they're, they have preserved that joyful part of themselves. So other times I find that soul parts haven't fully incarnated because um, again, the shock of the incarnation in this lifetime was so dramatic that if they all, all of them came in at the same time, it would be too unbearable. I mean, it's pretty unbearable for a lot of people as it is. You, you incarnate, you spend nine months in the womb, it can be a difficult time there depending on how you were received by your mother you know, attempted abortion, so all sorts of things, toxic womb, you know, drugs, alcohol, that kind of thing. Then you come to the birth trauma, bang, cesarean, forceps delivery, anesthesia at birth. And so if the person was fully there, they might disassociate to the extent where they wouldn't be present at all. So the soul part goes away into a safe place until it's such time as it's safe to come back again. Now, sometimes the soul um, comes back spontaneously itself. You'll have a dream where you, your soul part will, will re-engage re with you, or it might be it just spontaneously during your everyday life. But more often than not, I'm finding people need a practitioner, a shamanic practitioner, or a Jungian therapist, or somebody who knows about soul and respects the whole idea of soul, and knows this person is, is what they call in psychological terms, disassociating. Because the symptoms of soul loss are loss of memory, gaps in memory from childhood, a sense of emptiness, looking to fill that emptiness up from the outside in with drugs and alcohol and all sorts of material things. It never works because we can only heal ourselves from the inside out. So when I do a soul retrieval, I journey to my guides and I work with them. They teach me what to do. I, I may not know what's happening here, but my guides will show me. So they'll take me off on a journey. And often there's a healing happens in this journey too. 
uh, it, it happens on several different levels. On one level, I might be up at sleeve in a Calyuk working with the old, the old woman up there who has the energy body of that person in her healing space where she works on them, particularly with women in that space. Men, I work more with, with the law, in the lower world with Cronunus, the kind of male aspect of the God. And so there's, a, there's an actual energetic healing happens as an aside. And then she will say, or they will say, you go do your work and I'll journey back often along the timeline of the person's life. And I will see things or be shown things from that person's life that I don't know about an ordinary level awareness. And often I come back and I share that with the, the client. They're amazed that I've seen that, but it's been shown to me by spirit. It's not down to me. And then when I find a little boy or a little girl, a little fox that goes in and plays with them. And then I say, listen, little one, it's safe to come back now. That traumatic time in that person's life is over and they really need you back now because they're feeling empty. There's a lack of meaning in their lives and they're wanting to be fully embodied. So then I'll bring the soul part back and blow it into the heart chakra and the crown chakra. And people will often um, feel more enlivened. I often liken it to, if you have a balloon and it's half empty and you bounce it on the floor, it'll flop around the floor, but if you blow it up fully, it'll bounce. So the person bounces into their life again. And I've seen this happen many times in one-to-one -one sessions that I do at Dunderry Park people literally bounce out the door into their car to go home. And, and that's what I love about this work. When I see the immediate effects of a soul retrieval for somebody, like, I mean, I worked for years in mental health, as you know, 35 years as a psychiatric nurse and as a psychotherapist, but it was only when I got into the shamanic space and started working with spirits directly that I saw results as immediate and as effective as this. And only last week, you asked me uh, 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 soul retrieval. Last week, I saw a woman, whose husband had committed suicide recently. And she felt, you know, one of her friends who was a therapist said, well, maybe you should go on dairy because it sounds like part of your soul may have been missing. So I did the journey. And when I, and I talked to her about this, that we, you know, this was going to be perhaps more than just a soul retrieval. It might also turn into something what we call psychopomp work is like when, when people, um, and we'll talk more about this later, when people have died, they may need to be helped across into the upper world. But anyway, when I went to do the soul retrieval for her, I found that she still had left part of her soul with her dead husband in the afterlife because she didn't want to let him go. a deep healing in herself and then by the time we um finished the session you know she looked a lot clearer in herself so that's an example of how soul loss happens how a retrieval happens and, and a recent most of the work i do actually on one-to-one -one is um turning out to be soul retrieval amazing man amazing work. Yeah. um so i want to talk a bit now about um what's going on collectively right now in terms of um, the, the kind of experience we're all going through collectively. Um, do you feel that right now we might be having some kind of collective soul loss? And while we're actually going through it, uh, what's the way to navigate this situation so that we can minimize that kind yeah. of collective trauma, do you feel, at the, at the present time? Yeah, it's a good question, Paul, because during the first lockdown, again, I did a lot of journeying and, and, and some deep and powerful insights came in from spirit. And one of the things that I remembered was Stan Groff, who I trained with in holotropic breathwork, talked about psychedelics or holotropic breathwork as nonspecific amplifiers of the unconscious, meaning you take a psychedelic 
um, or, or a sacred plant, it amplifies what's already within you and brings it to the surface. And that's how the healing happens because you cathart and then you move it through and you become more conscious of what your shadow aspects are. So you're not triggered as much anymore. And the same with holotropic breathwork. And then I began to see the pandemic was like a non-specific amplifier of the personal unconscious of everybody at the moment and the collective as well. So where we've been locked down into our houses, we were being pushed back into ourselves. And what I noticed is there was a lot of stuff started happening on social media and one group was against the other group and they were fighting with each other and doing this and doing that and the other. And then I began to realize that, wait a minute here, um, something's happening on the personal level that is also part of a collective level. People are being triggered in their own personal psychology. So somebody who's locked in their house or in the room may be triggered that they had a difficult birth, locked in the birth canal for a long time, um, feel claustrophobic in general in their lives, and this is exasperate that problem. Or somebody else might have had anesthesia at birth, which means that every time they get stressed, they reach for drugs or alcohol to alleviate the, the, the pain because that was their initial experience, or whatever. So I began to see that the pandemic was pushing us all into these inner places in ourselves where we had no choice only to address our own um, issues, our own shadow. And the question is, if we didn't do that, and if we don't do that, then we project it out into the world and we blame others and blame others. And that's not to say by any means that there aren't things that are going on in the world that we shouldn't question. But I think we have an awful lot more power if we do our own inner work so we know exactly what is driving us, uh, what our shadow is, so then we can't be played or manipulated as much by our own unconscious material. So that's what I think is happening at a personal level, but also on the collective level as well. It's, there's a major evolutionary shift in consciousness going on here at the moment. And it's been played out with this Saturn-Pluto conjunction that's going on in the collective unconscious at the minute. Sorry, Martin, you hear me okay now? I can hear you now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, an interesting point was um, about the many different opinions that we're seeing on the planet right now, different reactions yeah. to uh, the virus and different uh, what's going on and the shift of consciousness. People all getting into arguments about different topics and about different things and not really seeing eye to eye. Um, what's, you know, in order for us to move forward, we need to move forward in a, in a spirit of collaboration and understanding. That's the only way these things work, these shifts yeah. work. And uh, you spoke to me a bit earlier about this, how you saw this, and you had a lovely image of it. Um, yeah. I think you might have experienced it in a journey. Would you share yeah. that with us, actually? Yeah, one of the most powerful journeys I had, and it came in over several journeys, I saw a great big black screen over to the left of me. And there were hordes of people walking into it or being corralled into it. And they were looking at their iPhones and eating hamburgers and drinking Coca-Cola, and they were just walking into this dark screen unconsciously. I mean, the masses of people, 80% of pop the population kind of thing, without questioning anything, unconscious of things. And it was like they were being, they were being taken in there or corralled in there or going in there voluntarily. And it was, like, it was like into the digital screen, if you like, you know, where we're downloading our consciousness into the digital world. And, 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 and this idea of art of AI as opposed to NI, artificial intelligence, as opposed to natural intelligence. So then there were four elements to this journey. The next people I saw were those who were looking over this dark screen saying, oh no, I'm not going in there. I see what's happening. I'm, I'm, there was a sense of waking up, but they were frightened. They were scared because they didn't know what to do. And they felt in, in a kind of no man's land in limbo. Then there was a third group of people over here. These were the people, um, like most of the people who are listening to this today or watching this today, who had been doing their yoga for years, meditation, shamanic journey, and holotropic breathwork, whatever they had done to open up, become more conscious. And they were aware. They were awake to what was going on. They were wise to the whole thing, but they were keeping centered within themselves. And that we had this realization they needed to continually raise their vibrational frequency in order to rise above the low level vibration of the Wetiko, this five psychic virus that I talk about. This everyday consciousness where we're numbed into unconsciousness by media, by our society, by whatever. 
these people were the yoga teachers, they were the yoga practitioners, they were the, the shamans, they were the shamanic practitioners, they were the, all these people and um, the therapists. And they were then being informed and helped by a fourth group who were in the spirit world, the spirit guides, the angels, the power animals, the archetypal beings like Jung and, and Jesus and Buddha and all these people. And they were being informed by them and they were being said, you must walk the road less traveled. And that's a difficult road because it means doing your inner work on the shadow so you can raise that vibrational frequency. And then these people then were turning to help this, the, the second group of people who needed help to, so they were recommending a book to them, saying maybe you should take a yoga class, maybe you should um, do some meditation or see a therapist. And then these people were getting help and they were graduating over to this third group. And then the second group were reaching towards the people who were unconscious and moving into the screen and maybe saying, hey, you know, maybe there's another way of seeing this and maybe it's not about us fighting with each other or whatever. Because the sense was, we're all in this together. Like none of us are getting out of this bardo state we're in, um, you know, until we all get out. And I mean, some of us, I think, sense that we need, we're here for a purpose and we're here for a reason. We have a, a destiny to play out, a soul's destiny. And that soul's destiny may, may be about what you're doing, Paul, um, what I'm doing, what all your listeners out there are doing is to try and help, to be of service, to not from an ego point of view, not saying I'm wonderful, I'm brilliant, you know, I have all the answers and, you know, pay me two and a half grand and I'll give you the, the keys to inner wisdom and you can transcend and, and, and find your way to nirvana. No, not that kind of stuff. There's, there's enough of that stuff out there. But I'm talking about people like you and me and, and the others who are listening in today who have a genuine feeling within themselves that they're here for a purpose at the moment and they're here to help. And they're actually, it's a privilege to be a soul incarnated in this world at this time, because we can do something, we can make a difference. Because I think we're at a pivotal point in human evolution. And I think that we, if we hold our nerve, do our inner work and reach out to each other with love and kindness and compassion, because I think that's what it's really all about, we can really make a difference here and, and help each other get through these times. And not only survive, but thrive as well. Beautiful, Martin. Thank you for that. That was a lovely, a lovely sharing. Um, when you're so used to the way, the way we are now, we're all kind of in our own echo chamber. So we kind of speak to people who agree with us and everything bounces back to us in social media as well. Um, when you come across someone who has a completely different view, <laughs> cannot even remotely uh, connect to the level of not, it's not, I don't want to use the word level, but the, the truth for this person is totally different to truth for you. Yeah. How do you invoke your compassion, your uh, spirit of collaboration in those moments? How do you do it personally? Personally, look, I, I, I have no judgments on people. Um, I see them where they're at. I see different souls at different levels of evolution and consciousness. And I see different souls burning karma in, in different ways. And, and it's in the burning of the karma provides the fuel for the individuation process to, to drive us to those higher vibrational frequencies. I tend to see everybody suffering. I mean, to be incarnate, to be human is to be suffering. But I see it from the point of view from the shaman, the wounded healer. The wound is the very thing in us that keeps us awake and drives us. And everybody is struggling with something. Everybody is suffering. But I see suffering as the growing pains of the soul that when you engage with your wound, engage with your suffering, it, it, it awakens you. You have no choice because you can't stay asleep if you're, if, if you're in pain and you're suffering. And most of us will run around like headless chickens trying to alleviate our suffering by drinking more alcohol, more sex, more drugs, more alcohol, more material things, until we run out of um, road and we find it doesn't work for us anymore. And then we have to get down to the serious business of going inwards doing your inner work and, and, and looking for help. And everybody gets to that point sooner or later. So these people who have no, um, we have no place to meet. And in fact, they would probably, you know, turn around and, and criticize me for my beliefs or what I do, or think I'm some sort of mad fucking idiot up there in the big house in Don Cherry Park. Well, shaman, what's a shaman, you know, banging his drum all day, all this kind of stuff. And I respect that. I, I, I understand that. I'm, I'm not trying to sell them anything. I mean, I'm not trying to convert them. 
I'm not trying to um, change their opinion because I know life itself will do that. I know the evolutionary process will bring them to a place where they're waking up. And when they're ready then, and, and when they need help, and they come along and they say, listen, Martin, I need help. I'll say, fine, I'm, I'm here for you. Well, I'll meet them where they are. I won't try to bring them to where I am. I say, okay, let, and I do that. I see some people for counseling and it's just ordinary everyday suffering, you know, and they're caught and they're, and they're stuck in it. But what I'm finding a fascinating thing at the moment, when I'm doing that work with people, I open them up. I open up the conversation to these ideas we're talking about, about soul and about soul loss. And about, and do you know what? They're getting it. Because I'm noting now that more people are waking up to the idea that their suffering has meaning and it has purpose and that they are on a, on a, on a soul journey. It's like it's in the atmosphere, it's in the air. And when I name it for them, at the level that they're ready to hear it, they're open to it. More and more so than, than I've ever noticed in the, in the last... 40 years I've been doing this work. Martin, some of the tools uh, that you use would require us kind of gathering in a group, the drumming, yeah. different things like this, the holotropic. So people who are listening here today and who are doing a home practice, we're all kind of looking after ourselves, doing us yoga or meditation. The tools of shamanism like breath work and drumming, how can we bring them into our lives like without actually attending an event? What would you advise people to do right now? Well, you see, Paul, this is the reason I've um, designed and, and this new course, this online course, The Elements of Shamanism, um, because people have been asking me, you know, what can I do at home? I'm, I'm, I can't get to Dundee Park to do workshops with you. So I've created this course. It's five modules. The first um, four modules are, you know, introductions to shamanism, shamanic cosmology, you know, the, the different worlds, lower world, middle world, upper world, the Jungian sense of shamanism, transpersonal theory. Um, and then the, 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 that's the first two modules. And then the third one is on soul loss, soul retrieval, like we just spoke about. And the, and the fourth one is on um, death, rebirth, and the afterlife. The whole idea of making death your friend, having it as an ally, as Carlos Castaneda would talk about, and also how to work with people who are dying, the idea of psychopomp work, and to you know get into a place of befriending you know the spirit of your death, so it doesn't become something you're so afraid of that you're you're terrified to to live. And then the last, the fifth module will be an experiential one. I'll be showing how to call in directions. Um, Annette will be with me talking about druidry and druidism. Um, then we'll be talking about the altar, how to how to how to set it up, and then. We'll do a live shamanic journey on the fifth module, teaching people how to take a shamanic journey and how to use the rattle and drum and also in stalking awareness. So the whole course, the five modules, which will be launched in January, as you said, um, it's been launched now, but it'll be running in January. It's, the idea is to give people some tools to work with at home. And then as part of the course, I'll be creating a social media hub where people can meet and share their experiences together. And then I'll have question and answer session on Zoom like this, where people come in and ask questions and um, you know, to connect together as a community. Now, to be honest with you, Paul, mm -hmm. that course is no substitute for, and this is why I've had some resistance and reluctance to coming into the online space, because there's no substitute for meeting in person in the grounds like at Dunderry Park or somewhere beautiful in nature. Going out in the morning, I miss the, the sound of the drums in the morning at the Dairy Park where we would go out at nine o'clock and stalk awareness. That's meditating deeply in nature and people would sit under their favorite tree or their power place and they'd beat their drum or, or rattle call in directions. And I'd stand on the front steps and I'd be like, I'm missing that, I'm really missing that. Mm -hmm. And then we come back into the room and we'd, we'd share in circle and then we'd have journeys. And then people would work with each other, say how to practice power animal retrieval with each other how to practice an extraction um, ritual with each other, how to do a soul retrieval with each other. That was all part and is part of the practitioner's training. Now, one of the reasons I was so keen to open up in September with the shamanic gathering was I wanted to make a statement to the, to, 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 in general to the, to, to the community, but also to spirits. And the minute this thing opens up, I'm out. And that's the statement I wanted to make. And we got away with it. We didn't think we would. I mean, I hired a tent. I paid four grand deposit. I said, I'm going to lose this. Everyone's saying, you're crazy. 
And then Tasha got on board. He says, well, sure, we stick on a little music concert as well. Mm. And I said, we've got to do this. We've got to do this because we've got to show people that this is not all over and this is not over. So come March the 20th, 21st, I'll have that tent back in there. We're looking on buying a tent at the moment, actually. And I'm going to do my courses outside. In fact, the lockdown, they can lock us down to 100 or whatever, and the plus problem, but I'm going to have a tent where I'm going to do the practitioners, the basic workshops and the practitioners courses outside in the tent. And then part, some of the people can stay in the house at social distancing, others can camp, others can go and stay in local B&Bs or whatever. But the moment we get to go ahead, we're starting and we're getting out there. In the meantime, this course, the online course, will give people the tools and the, and, and the ways of working. And, and it, it, it's a practical course, to be honest with you. It's, it's how to work with a journey, how to do shamanism at home. And it's particularly set up, it's very good for people new to shamanism as an introduction. But well, I've also designed it in such a way that it is, is, a, is, it is a review and it is, it is a kind of a sense of looking back for people, practitioners who've done shamanic training already. So they can review the course again, they can um, look back and revisit um, all the courses that they've, all, all the modules they've done on a shamanic practitioner's course, whether it was with me, I've done Derry Park or somewhere else. So this course, the five modules, was, is a refresher on everything you've learned about shamanism on a practitioner's course. And it's also giving you a chance to connect back in with the community. And for those new to shamanism, it's going to give you the bones of how to use this in your own life, in your everyday home life. My favorite part of that, Martin, was feck the lockdown. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I saw yeah, people, the, some yeah. people laughing there in the background. That was great. That was great. And you came along, Paul, and, and support us. I appreciate that you came to the concert, and, and, and it was great to see you there. And as you saw, we had, we had a tent in the field, and we had live music, Paul Noonan and others. And do you know what? People came up to me after and said, thanks for doing this, Martin, because we, we were, we were, do you know one moment said, we, I was missing hearing the sound of a generator in the woods. <laughs> you know, that's that kind of thing. And, and she says, even, even the portable loos, it, 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 was, it, was, it was a pleasure <laughs> to get back. <laughs> yeah. The portable loos were back. So, yes. um, yeah, it's be it was a beautiful uh, event. Thanks for running that. And to see live music and hang out with people and listen yeah. to stories. And it was just fantastic. And it was all done. As you say, for people, if they are concerned, it's incredibly yeah. safe. You're outdoors. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful event. Beautiful we're, event. Going, we're going to do more concerts now in the new year. Natasha of Soft Productions, um, my daughter, as you know, her, yeah. she, she is booking in bands as we speak to do more of that from March onwards for the next year. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, the whole area then of death and rebirth is interesting at the moment because the fear of death is being portrayed as this massive, uh, terrible thing. And really, it's something we're all going to experience. None of us are getting away with it. Uh, mm -hmm. Death, rebirth, and the afterlife is one of the uh, modules. And I just want to ask you, um, that fear that's being portrayed, I mean, death really is, uh, it's, it's, it's a change of energy. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a, we wake up somewhere else. We move on with our journey. How, from the shaman's perspective, can you ease that sense of dread that so many people have and the media portray about death? I mean, death can, can be viewed in shamanism as some kind of a maybe a release, a celebration. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Absolutely. One thing I've noticed about doing the practitioner's course over the years is that many people who come back and they want to repeat a particular module, and it's usually the death, uh, rebirth, and afterlife module, because they said this module... And this way of working has changed my whole life in terms of when I journey to make meet the spirit of my death and make it an ally, keep it on my left shoulder as a teacher and advisor for life. And then when I'm ever in a sticky situation, I turn to my death, spirit of my death. So how do you, what, what, what about this? And, 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 the, and the spirit guide, which is your death, says, well, no, it looks bad. It's pretty heavy and it's pretty stressful. I should go down here like, oh, no. But you know, one day you'll draw your last breath, you'll exit this body and you'll go back into spirit. So what? Big deal. Do your work now so that when you get to your old age and you're ready to die, that you're going to go in a way that is an adventure of self-discovery. You you lived your life as an adventure of self-discovery and your death is a self, the, the, um, an adventure of self-discovery. Because when you look at it, when we're born, we die. And when we die, we're born. 
When we born, we die to the oceanic womb experience and we come into physical um, breathing um, mammalian life. And then when we die, we leave that physical body, that mammalian breathing, and then we go back into spirit. And there's an old saying, you know, looking at death from, from another point of view, those who die before they die don't die when they die. And what we're talking about there is ego death. These are the small deaths of letting go, of releasing fears, releasing self-imposed limitations that we put on ourselves, and then being reborn into a newer, bigger, greater self for ourselves. And when we, when, we, when we look at shamanism, the shamanic sense of death, the shaman has no fear of death because the shaman or the shamanic practitioner journeys over and back into the spirit world all the time. That's what we do when we're doing healing, when we're doing journeys, when we're looking for information and wisdom from our guides. We're journeying into the other world. And that other world is the place we go to when we die. So one of the um, things we do on the course the, on death and, and, and rebirth and the afterlife module is we set up a scroll of directions, which is a book that we keep for our lives, that every journey we take, we, 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 we write into it what we've witnessed on the other side. So we create a map for where we go after we die. And we also contract with our spirit guides that when we die, they'll be there waiting for us to escort us to the upper world and bring us back and, our, and we connect with our ancestors so they will be there for us too. So death isn't this just terrible, crazy thing anymore because there's a, t there's a taboo in our culture about death. We lock it away in the backwards. We bury it away in, 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 in these hospital spaces because people don't want to know or face death. We, you know, you, you go to these places in, in America, particularly the, 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 the crematorium, the places where they, do, they look after the dead and they, they have doing plastic surgery on them. They, 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 they put makeup on them because people don't want to look into the face of death. I find that, and I don't want to sound morbid here, but particularly now in the last year, death has become a real good friend to me. Um, the spirit of my death, because it's shown me things and I, I, I had to let go of a lot of things. When, when this lockdown comes, all the courses closed, the center shut down, I had to let all my staff go, staff go on furlough and all of that. And we had, a, we had a good thing going. Like, I mean, this year was shaping up really well. And I, I had to go to a place in myself where, I, well, what's going to happen here? How are we going to make it through? How are we going to survive? And how are we going to keep the lights on? And my death, spirit of death came to me and said, don't worry about it. Um, let it go. Because what's going to happen to here, you're going to let go of where you were and what was the past, because that's gone now. You're never going back there. So you have to sit in the not knowing for a while, which I did for some months. And now I'm finding, I'm far, I'm, I'm, I, I've, I've got something back. It's like I've got part of my soul back again. I'm finding myself excited again. I find myself having got a deeper perspective on life and death and the whole thing. And I'm really excited going back teaching again now when we do open up because I have something deeper in me now that I want to be able to share with people. And that was death. That was the spirit my death showed me and taught me that. And sometimes I sat in the starkness of even now in the winter. And it, it, used, to, it used to get to me a little bit, you know, being up there in Dundee Park on my own in, in the winter, in November, December, January. But now I'll stop and I say, oh, there you are. There you are. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? It's in the stillness of this moment I'm meeting that spirit. And you know what? It's like, it's okay. It's okay. It doesn't matter. So I think a lot of what's going on with the fear porn out there in the world is frightening people. Oh, you're going to die. You know, you're going to get this. You're going to get that. Something's going to happen. Yeah, you're going to die. We're all going to die. But I mean, you know, the choice we have in that is that how we die, and, 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 and die now to what's restricting us so that we're not living with this terrible fear within us that's holding us back from actually living our lives as fully as we can. So that's for me what's, what shamanism helps. And, and particularly, I've noticed people who've done that course, when they're, when they're with loved ones who are dying, they're able to be more present with them and, 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 and hold their, the space with them. And often they'll tell me now that... They, they're the ones that are called on by their loved ones to sit with them when they're dying because they, they sense, they sense, because they're not holding them back. They're not, you know, in the Bardo told all the Buddhist, um, the Tibetan book of living and dying, they say the soul is moving on for 47, 48 days after we die and not to disturb it too much when it's leaving. And, and you should pray and they say these mantras, you know, helping the soul move on. 
And I'm finding that that idea very useful because another one of the journeys we do, we journey to our, in, the, in this course, to our older self, the 85 year old man or woman. And we sit with them and say, you know, how's it gone? And the old self said to you, well, you know, look, I'm looking back at where you are now. You're what, you're 35 now, you're 40, you're 50, you're 60 now. There's just things you need to let go of. There's things you need to change if you want to get to a place in your older life where you'll be comfortable in yourself and not a bitter old man or woman, and you'll be ready to release yourself into spirit as an adventure of self-discovery. So that's the kind of perspective death and, and, and rebirth give, gives me anyway. Yeah, yeah. And in this moment, Martin, in this kind of eye of the storm, there's something new emerging, something new being created. Um, how much attention do we need to give what's falling apart around us, the current system? Do you feel we need to resist it in any way or just completely zone into creating our own, creating a new, more empowered reality? Do we give zero attention to what's going yeah. on or do we need to stand up? You know, that's the question oh, I would, I'm asking. Yeah, I wouldn't say not to give it any zero or attention or zero attention. I think you're right. I think first of all, we need to be centered in ourselves. We need to do our inner work and we need to know where our own triggers are and, and what our sh shadow issues um, are so that we can't be played by that. Because, you know, if we're unconscious of stuff, um, we can be played in that place. Like, you know, for example, you know, during the second, before the Second World War, um, you know, you know, they talked about Liebenstrom, which was freedom and, and movement into new spaces. And they were using language and you see the cartoons of octopuses strangling babies and all that kind of thing. Same was the same in, in Soviet Russia and, and in other places. So the octopus um, crushing the little baby was activating the perinatal unconscious of the people of the, of, of, in society. So they were being manipulated by the propaganda to um, be triggered into their own birth trauma so that they then would be activated psychologically and then react in the way that um, the powers that be wanted them to become. So that's the first thing. When we know ourselves and we have our own sense of ourselves, we can't be played as much. Now, on the external level, there's no question about it. Our world is changing. And there is a reset happening uh, on a global level and from, from a financial um, point of view, from political point of view, socially, uh, social engineering. Um, it's like the powers that be behind the scenes have, have stopped and said, you know, it's time to reset everything whether it's moving to a digital um, currency or it's moving to a more centralized, globalized um, system. Um, it's it it's certainly moving towards technology and, and pushing us more into the dark screen. Um, and, um, you know, and, and all that that means in, in many different ways. So I think then when we become empowered in ourselves, the next thing we do, what happens is, we become aware, we see it. We see through the illusion, Maya, the Hindus talk about the great illusion, Maya, Samskara, and we see it. And then we, we, we pierce through the veils of illusion and we say, aha, wait a minute here. I, I, I'm not buying this. I, 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 there's more to this than what I'm being told. And then you can make informed choices and you come back to being sovereign in yourself in the sense that you, you own your own space you're in touch with your own heart and your own soul. And then what happens is I find, as your vibrational frequency shifts to higher levels, you start meeting other people who are similar to you then. You gravitate to each other into that third space that I'm talking about and moving into the fourth space, which is the higher. And this idea came to me on the lockdown too, that we can be in the world, but not of the world. And the, and the vision I was shown was on the journey that you can create a space that is an interdimensional space that you can inhabit. While you live in the world, you, you cook your dinner, you pay your taxes, you earn your money, you look after your kids, but you have a place you go to within yourself that is above and beyond all of that. So you're not attached to the outcomes in the middle world. You're, you're in a new place and you've crossed over into this place where you have peace and tranquility, non-attachment. It's like we're all our Buddhist friends have told us for hundreds of years and you're, and, I mean, I, I used to read about that stuff. I used to think about that stuff. I, I used to think, oh, I'd like to be able to do that. And now I'm finding more and more, it's just happening. 
it just seems to be a shift in the collective that, that's made it easier for me and others to access that space, where in other times, other generations, you might have to meditate on a bowl of rice up in the Himalayas for 50 years um, to get to this place. So I see what's happening on two levels. The, the darkness that's coming in, the Wetiko, that psychic virus, it's certainly you know, frightening people and it's dragging them into the dark screen, but it's also driving people to wake up. It's driving people to question things. And it's driving people to have an insight into, and people who would never have done this before, and then they'll say, oh, I need, I need to read more Jung or, or, or look at shamanism or look at yoga or meditation or, or do something else because, because something's happening here and I want to know more about it. So, so, and that's the thing about the Wichita virus. It has two, it's, it's, it's two sides, it's double-edged. One is, yeah, it can it come in and take over as shadow and it becomes dark and, and, and insidious. But on the other side of it, it also drives us to um, um, engage with our own shadow and heal that deep place so that we can move on to those other levels that I spoke about. It's a beautiful, the word you use, sovereignty, I, 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 it's, I'm a big fan of that word. It's got a certain energy about it. Um, just to go over to people there who are listening now, you feel free to start typing your questions in as we move into the second half and we'll do a little Q&A. Um, so the energy of, uh, I'll, I'll We'll see the questions as they come into the chat box there. So type away, folks, when you're ready. Um, but the energy of sovereignty, Martin, it's got a beautiful ring to it, that word. And yeah. uh, I think it's something we all want for ourselves. And it's the one thing we all also want for each other, you know? It's a very, yeah. it's not something you would begrudge anybody of, you know? You would say, I, I respect that person as a sovereign being, you know, to have the freedom to make their own choices and to make their own moves in life. So what, I'm just wondering from a shamanic perspective, what does the, that energy of sovereignty, what do, you, what do you feel when you think of that word or that energy? Yeah, for me, it comes back to soul, that um, we all are souls incarnate in physical matter and space, and that we are part of the great collective. We're a divine spark of the great consciousness. And therefore, we are, we're, we're, we're individuals, we're expressing ourselves as individuals here and now as, as, as Paul and Martin and John and Mary or whatever. But ultimately for me, um, we're, we're, we're part of the spark of the collective consciousness. And nobody has a right to question another person's journey uh, or to disempower them or think that they can be controlled, manipulated and managed. Um, to do what they want for, for financial gain or for control or for power. So therefore, for me, personal sovereignty is about connecting to my own soul divinity and knowing that I'm part of a bigger story and a bigger picture and that I have trans, that transpersonal view. And if I know that, I'm not going to surrender my sovereignty. I'm not going to give away myself because I know that it's too precious. I know that, in fact, that the only game in town here is for me to burn karma and use the energy to drive my individuation process to those le higher levels of vibration and frequency that I talk about. That's my reason here. That's why I'm here. That's why you're here. That's why we're all here. There are those in this world who are maybe unconscious of that, or they're unaware of it, or they know it. But they, 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 you see, I think the lust for financial gain, the lust for power, the lust for acquisitions and materialism. It, it's a, it's, it's a, there, these people are going down a cul-de-sac. The, the desire in them is true. It's real. That, I mean, the, the, the divine sparks in all those people too. But it has gone, it, 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 has, it has attached to material things, gold, silver, diamonds, anything that shines or power, because that's, that's, that's what they're searching for. They're searching for the light of consciousness. But they have mistaken material worldly possessions and power for it. So they've gone chasing down the wrong road for it. And they end up in a cul-de-sac and they get further and further away from it all the time. Whereas when you are able to let go of all those things and, and engage with your personal sovereignty and orientate yourself towards this third group, this light energy, this, this um, spirit world, then that stuff is an impediment to your spiritual progress. It holds you back. You don't make the, the, more, the more you're engaged with that side of things, the less. Has, and here's the thing, the beautiful thing, um, and many of you have found this, you can't buy this. It doesn't have a price. 
there is no charge for it. And in fact, if you tried to do that, you'd lose it. It's ineffable. It's a beautiful thing. It's, it's, it's a light energy. And, and when, you, when you let go of all that um, stuff from the ego, it's given to you free of charge. Yeah. Okay. I can't hear you now, Paul, so you're, you've gone mute there. There you go. There you there go. You are. Yeah. Back again, yeah. So the uh, first question coming in, sorry, I just sat with that anyway, so I was glad I was, glad I was muted because uh, yeah. there was a lovely silence there, which was nice to allow that to settle. That energy yeah. of sovereignty, I think, is very indicative of what's going on on the planet right now, and I'm yeah. sure the people out there can feel that mm. uh, sense of sovereignty. And the first question from Catherine is, she would like to arrange one-on-one -on -one sessions for her teenage daughter. Are you doing one-on-ones at the moment, Martin? Are you, what's happening there? No, I am. I'm seeing people in person um, because I've been asked to do Zoom sessions and, and I've done a couple, but I prefer to see people one-on-one -on -one be in the energy room. It's all socially distanced and it's all um, properly done, you know, but I am, I'm seeing people one-to-one. -one. If she wants to email info at shamanismireland.com, Annette will arrange an appointment for her. We'll have a chat with her on Wednesday when we're in. That's brilliant. Info at shamanismireland.com. Yeah. Um, brilliant. And Aidan is asking around energy work. He is finding his own energy levels are very heavy. Is mm -hmm. it best to just stay with that heaviness to allow it to be, or should he be working through it? Two things. I think he should go into it and meditate with it and, 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 and drop into uh, dialoguing with it taking that energy up and then drawing mandalas, pictures, or, and, and creating artistic expression, journaling it in his journal, doing, taking a shamanic journey, and the technique we use on the shamanic counseling is put the headphones on, listen to the shamanic drumming on the CD, and speak your journey out, and record it on your, on your smartphone, and then listen back to it. And it's like what, what happens is you're, you're getting a message from yourself, from the other side, and when you listen back to it, you get a lot of insight and, and healing comes out with it. It's what we teach on the shamanic counseling. So that's another thing. And then, of course, I always say to folk, move, get moving. You know, whether it's running, walking, exercising out in nature, um, sitting with, with the energy of nature, but, but move your energy. We take yoga classes, you know, meditation, whatever, but move the energy as well as sitting with it. Because it, otherwise it'll stagnate. And there's a danger that will pull us into it. And then we be, think, oh, I'm depressed now, and this is my reality. No, it's not. This is your reality that you've dropped into. It's, it's, it's temporary. Um, if, don't stay stuck in it. Um, of course, speak to it. Like, I mean, Robert Johnson, in a beautiful little book, I'd recommend to people called Inner Work. He, had a ten, he was a young analyst, had a tendency towards depression. And what he would do every evening at 6 o'clock, he would make an appointment with his, with his depression. Because he would say to it, listen, I have a, I, I, I will a living to earn for both of us here. You know, I mean, so don't be coming in during the day when I'm seeing patients and clients. So, so, so the depression would come to him at six o'clock in the form of a big lion. And he'd come in and he'd he did what the Jungian um, active imagination, similar to shamanic journey. And um, he'd sit down, this big lion would come in and you have a chat, what do you want? And the lion would say this, or the lion would say, somebody, other people see it as a black dog or some other manifestation. And you, you talk to it, you, you actually dialogue with it. You give it, a, you give it a shape or an image or, or a feeling within you. And you sit with it, you dialogue, and then it'll move on because it'll, it, it, it'll have done its job. Its job is to get your attention. And if you give it attention, then it'll start leaving you alone because it doesn't have to drag you into those um, places anymore because you're listening. Once you're dialoguing and listening with your psyche, with your soul, things become a lot better for you over time. Brilliant. Uh, thanks for that question, Aidan. Um, Ellen, Ellen is asking, um, can you talk more about how to burn karma to raise your vibration? Yeah. Well, I can say to Ellen, she's doing it right now, this minute. Um, the fact that you breathe, the fact that you're in a human body, the fact that you exist in this three-dimensional space and time means that there are things in your life that is causing you annoyance, irritation, and suffering. And as I said, the suffering is the growing pains of the soul. So it's engaging with the suffering, engaging what, with what annoys you, engage you with, with what you don't want. If you want to know what you should be working at, 
and working on. Look to where you don't want to go. Look to where you don't want to work, what you don't want to work on and do and go there. And then in the very act of engaging with that wound, the, the, you know, it might be childhood stuff, it might be, you know, your anxiety, your stress, depression. Don't run away from it. Don't turn turn away from it. Engage directly with it. And that act of turning your, your awareness to it, your consciousness to it, is engaging with your wound. And that is what provides the fuel to in, the individual. Because you grow in that encounter with yourself. And you grow in that encounter with your suffering. Suffering so in our culture is seen as something bad, as something we, 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 we have to hide away, something we have to numb ourselves from. Well, as I said to people, and I believe it for myself, the wound is the best thing in us. If we didn't have that sense of suffering and that woundedness, we'd go to sleep, we'd become unconscious. And you see it around you, you'll see people doing that. And, and, and you know, to have the big yacht, to have all the, all the money, to have the wealth to go. But, you know, you get to a point in the life, as Joseph Campbell once said, climbing the ladder of success to find when you get to the top of it, it's up against the wrong wall. You reach midlife, your life's empty. There's no soul in it. And yet somebody... Some of the most amazing people I know, people in inner city Dublin, who've had rough times, drugs, all sorts of stuff have gone on in life. And I tell you this, they have been my best teachers because they have suffered, really suffered from the very beginning. And when I meet them, I'm in awe of them. I'm in absolute awe of their integrity and their honesty and their straightforwardness. And like they may be uneducated, uncouth or uncultured, or whatever, but by God, are they truly spiritual? There's no bullshit with them. And they have the most amazing bullshit detectors I've ever come across. And like the moment you go offside or try to go offside with them, they'll have you. They'll be there because they know what raw suffering is. They've lived their lives with that. They're not going to take some guru, um, shaman, telling them, you know, oh yeah, do this course, do that course and, and, and pay me this amount of money and, and you'll be healed and you'll be enlightened. No, they say, fuck off, you know, I mean, we, we, we're not buying that bullshit. That's why I love those people. Because, well, they keep me honest too. They keep me straight too, you know, and, and we all need to watch our shadow and watch our ego because it can get, it can get amplified and it can, it can take over. And, and I think that's what our suffering does. It keeps us from taking ourselves too seriously. Brilliant, brilliant. So that's a great uh, shout out for the L in our city heads, the North yeah. Siders on yeah. Fingers Head myself. Yeah. So I know I, that type of, <laughs> yeah, cutting oh, yeah. right through it. Cutting right it. through it. Um, yeah. You get a bit of it on the South Side too, but not as much, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and you get it in Limerick, Cork, Belfast, Galway. Oh you yeah, get, you get it everywhere. You can get up and hack balls across around from outside them dock. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Frank Kelly is asking, um, sovereign is indeed an empowering word. What is Martin's thoughts on purpose, how to connect with your purpose and practically apply it? Yeah, you see, our purpose is constantly circling us, um, looking for us to engage with it and um, connect with it. And the funny thing, and it's back to what I've been saying, saying earlier, um, it's very simple and it's very easy to get in touch with our destiny, our soul's destiny, which is again, what I'm talking about in terms of purpose. Well, it's the last thing most of us want to do because it means taking that road less traveled. <clears throat> it means going into the sore, difficult places in ourselves. And, and, and therein lies, lies the truth and lies the, the, the purpose of, of what we're here to do. Um, we won't get it from studying or reading books or attending courses or whatever, unless it's something like holotropic breathwork that you know, is about pushing you to go inside yourself and do your inner work or, or working with your dreams or, or whatever. So our purpose, your purpose is right there with you. If you want to know what it is, several things. What are you passionate about? What do you get excited about? Is what I say to people. The old shamans would say, I remember down in the, in, when I was down in the Amazon with the old shaman, he would say, you know, when people come with soul loss or whatever, he'd say, when did you last dance? When did you last sing? When did you last laugh? Because he saw the lack of all of those things as indications of soul loss and lack of purpose and lack of meaning in life. Jung said it too in, 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 in Man's Search for Soul. He said, it, 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 the biggest problem in our culture today was was lack of meaning in people's lives and that usually is to do because they're disconnected from their purpose 
and your purpose is here with you right now, as I say, for all those reasons I just outlined and, and, and those ways of actually connecting to what I call soul destiny. Same thing for me as purpose. Brilliant. Thanks for that question, Frank. Um, Lucy is asking about this astrological, uh, and this has been a, an incredible year astrologically. I think everybody would agree on that one. Um, all the astrologers have said this is going to be the year we're all going to remember uh, from yeah. a planetary perspective. So this yeah. winter solstice astrologically, there is a conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn. This is being seen symbolically as equivalent to a birth, the crowning of a head in the birth process as yeah. indicating the birth of a new era. And the astrologer I know said it was the first hint of the Aquarian age. So I'm yeah. just wondering, uh, Lucy is wondering, Martin, do you have any comment on that big alignment on the winter solstice? Yeah, I, I've, I've read some of this uh, stuff and I've, I've, I've seen stuff coming in and um, it seems to be a pivotal moment where it's part of this kind of collective reset. Um, you know, you have Jupiter, coming in, into play, you have Aquarius, which is certainly, you know, moving from Capricorn into, into Aquarius. Capricorn is very serious, but laws and regulation, it has to be done a certain way. Aquarius, Aquarius is more progressive, opening up the individual in, into collective um, awakening and consciousness. And so that Aquarian energy is, is tipping into play from the 21st of December. But that's only the start of something. It's only the beginning. It's a shift to a new... Um, new perspective. It's not going to happen overnight, but I think, and it's a positive thing. It, it means that we're maybe getting out of this heavy kind of authoritarian Capricornian energy into a more air, air, of course, Aquarian is, is fixed air. It's more to do with the future. It's more to do with the Uranus. It's more to do with the, the kind of um, the, the, the technology and science and all that, but, but how we can use that in a positive way, as we're doing here right now. Like, I mean, we talk about and I opposed the AI earlier on. Aquarius brings us into the space we're in right now. But there's maybe a hundred people here or more sitting at our screen and we're having, a, we're having a connection, we're having a dialogue, and that's a very positive thing. Even, even if there was no um, lockdown, we, we wouldn't be able to come together as regulators. So in that sense, Aquarius is, is quite positive. So, the, so and I, I, like, I like Lucy's analogy with the birth. I think mm. we are going through a birth. We're going through a death rebirth, I think, is what happened. The old system is dying, the old norm. I think the Capricornian um, building of structures, which became too much top-heavy, our, our whole political system, our financial system, our world system has become top-heavy. It's become un unsustainable, and it's, going to, and it's collapsing now, and it will collapse. And so it needs to collapse. So Aquarius will come in with a new new energy, a rebirth into, into a new space. And you see, as I said earlier, this has been going on for millennia. If you went back, if we went back to the Middle Ages and went back a thousand years, things have come and gone. Humanity has evolved and changed and grown out of these crises in the past. And we will again now. And, and, and that's what I love about archetypal astrology. People like Rick Tarnas and Stan Grock very much into it, as Jung was as well. Because what they are able to show us is a map of what's evolving. They're not telling it, oh, this is how it's going to be, like popular astrology. It's not like, you're, what's your star sign or whatever. It's, they're looking at movements in the collective unconscious archetypally that will, have, will, will shape the energies of our time, and therefore our society will be impacted in a particular way by these energies. And it's positive stuff. It's brilliant. And, she's, when, and thank you, Lucy. And you described it as the crowning of the head and the birth process. It's funny, Corona as well, uh, I think, yeah. translates to crown. Someone told yeah. me that. Anthony Sharkey told me that. Yeah. Um, Tanya is asking, she's saying she's been doing shamanic journeying for years, and she's found this year her journeys have been, um, uh, they were very, very vivid. Um, but this year they've been quite simple um, yeah. in, in, in their unfolding. Is there a disconnect or is this just part of the process? What I find very interesting, a lot of people are very having vivid dreams um, this year. <clears throat> There's a lot of stuff coming up in the dream time from the collective unconscious, and that was um, finding its way into people's personal unconscious and then into consciousness. The journeys, um, you know, I've, I've had to, the kind of opposite experience. My journeys this year have become far more vivid, far deeper, and, and, and more connected. But I, I noticed with some of my clients that the, their, their journeys are becoming more simple in the sense 
that the message is coming through very clearly, very quickly, without any amb uh, ambiguity. It's just there and it's in your face and it's been, and so they're finding that they're having less difficulty journeying because the answers have been given them to much more readily without them having to, to keep going back and do another journey and another journey. So maybe that's what Tanya's experiencing, that it's like, it's just simplifying itself because I think we're all in a, in, in a space where we've been pushed and forced to be, to be more attentive to what's going on within ourselves. And I think spirit's able to speak to us much more easily because we're less distracted at the moment. Uh, Patricia is looking for a quick book recommendation for an introduction to astrology from a shamanic perspective. Do you know a book of that, Martin? I would recommend, she looks up, Rick Tarnas, or, I, uh, or Richard Tarnas, T-A-R-N-A-S. He, he, he wrote, he's written some very good articles, he's a lot of good stuff on YouTube, and he has, he has um, the, the Passion of the Western Mind is a powerful book that he wrote about the archetypal ast astrological situation that's going on at the moment. So he's a, he's a good place to start. And then you can, you can branch out from, from there because he, he'll be making other recommendations. So his daughter too, Becky Turnus, is a very good astrologer too. And his wife also, the, the whole family. And I, I, I like their approach because they, 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 they come from a, a psychological astrological point of view and archetypal. And, um, it's 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 very relevant to 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 people individually and personally, but also collectively at the at the moment too. Uh, Eileen is asking about. She says losing pieces of your soul. She has always felt that the pieces are lost in inverted commas in all senses of the word. Mm. They're not happy, as we yeah. have talked about here. She doesn't feel that they're off somewhere being happy in a sense. Yes. She she loves the idea of it, but she's not yeah. sure she believes it. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, she won't know until she goes there, um, really goes there and, and journeys into that place. Um, I mean, you know, I'm, I know, and it, and it can be true that um, some people who have soul loss, um, their soul can get trapped in in between places. Um, I've worked with people say who've had a road traffic accident when, it, when we went back to find the soul part it was still standing on the side of the road confused and lost and, and didn't know where to go or how to get back home again I've done soul retrievers for the people so who um, you know were went had a, had a, a physical operation and, and on their anesthesia drifted into a kind of amorphous kind of foggy space and couldn't find their, their way back from there so there are times that when we have soul loss um, when the retrieval has been done, that it may be uh, an unpleasant place that the soul has gotten trapped in or lost in. And all the more reason to learn to do this work and to um, work on bringing the little soul parts back again. And we have, um, thank you for that, um, uh, Eileen. And uh, Eileen actually went on to say that she was also a little bit confused by the term sovereignty. Um, that she confuses it with ego in some way. Okay, so can mm -hmm. you kind of give it a much more, yeah, cleaner explanation, the word sovereignty, the term sovereignty? Yeah, yeah it, well, again, I mean, the word, if what comes back to me is this sense of self. And I'm talking about self in the Jungian self sense. Jung talked about the self as, as, as the, the, he talked about the ego, which is just the, the way we are in the everyday world. And I could understand how it could be misinterpreted. Sovereignty is about an ego thing and it could be interpreted in that way. What Jung talked about, the process of individuation was about connecting the, 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 what he called the ego self axis. He said the ego, when it, becomes into, when it comes into relationship with the self, which is the self is beyond the ego, it's beyond space, it's beyond time. It's the part that's in the collective unconscious, the part that is soul. And when, when we get to that self, that's the part that knows of our soul's purpose. It knows why we're here. It knows that life is more than just our individual experiences. And in that sense, when you move to, to connecting to self there, sovereignty is about being one with the cosmos, one with the collective consciousness, and one with being a spark of divinity that's incarnated here in time. Now that could be translated down into the ego level of, yeah, you know, I, and you see a lot of people who walk around like this. I mean, their sense of themselves is that they're the most important person in the world and have a narcissistic 
um, perspective on things where they they think their worldview and their perspective on, on the world is, is, is the right one and everybody else should conform to the way they are. In that sense, I could see how ego would grab the idea of sovereignty and use it in, in, in a negative way. It's the same with everything. But from the, from the higher self, it's a different, it's a different thing altogether. Can you do, um, Martin, uh, Gabby is asking, can you do a soul retrieval for yourself? Wow. Yes, you can. In the sense that, as I said earlier, sometimes the soul parts will come back themselves spontaneously and they will emerge and um, come back in a dream or come back in everyday reality or whatever. And then at other times, you could do a conscious journey, take a journey and you could then connect with your power animals and your, your spirit guides and say, I've lost part of my soul. I don't know where it is and take a journey with them, particularly one of your power animals or spirit guides that you really trust. Take a journey with them and um, go hunting for your soul a part that's lost and they will find it for you and they will do the retrieval and then bring it back for you. So it's not so much you're just doing it for yourself, but you're doing it with your spirit guides who will do it for you. So you take the journey with them and then they help reunite you with your soul part again so you can do that yeah you can do it for yourself okay great and um, we're coming to the last about we've got about 10 minutes to go folks so feel free to type in some more questions there if you wish martin i just want to take this opportunity now to just let people know where they can find out about the course um, is there something i can put up here that people can see yes you can or we're just having our new refreshed website Uploaded at the moment, it should be up by tomorrow. That's www.shamanismireland.com. Okay. Um, it may be down at the minute, but it, it should be up tomorrow. And then, of course, my Facebook page, Martin Duffy Facebook page, it'll be the course will be going up there. And then on the Shamans Ireland Facebook page and Instagram, that's all going. Myself and Natasha are sitting down over the next few days, putting all that out. And we'll also be sending out our drumbeat newsletter, which many of your people who, who, who get it um it's it's a monthly newsletter that we announce on our courses if you want to be included in that database or in that um, um newsletter just email us at info at shamanismireland.com and mm -hmm. we, we 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 get we get the information to you brilliant brilliant um, so the course, as i said the course has been launched this week we're going to do we're going to do an early bird on it so to give people a good chance again the five modules we're launching at, um, you know, 145 euro up until the winter solstice to keep it reasonable for people so that, you know, um, it's not too much of a burden um, just to get in on, on doing this work. So up until the winter solstice, it'll be at, at, at 145 um, for the five modules and the Q&A and everything else that goes with it. And it's yeah. kind of acting as a bridge because as yeah. you said, you're going to come back and do your live, your live events, hopefully by next March and, and kick all that off again. So in the yeah, meantime, this is a bridge for people. Yes. It's a bridge between, between now and then we're hoping to open for the spring um, in the, the spring equinox on the 21st of March, actually to mark that as our opening time. Um, and, and we'll be announcing all that on our, on our drumbeat newsletter too. Uh, great. That moves us on now to Sabine is asking, how do you start a conversation with yourself when there is too much fear of facing the pain inside? Great question. Yes. It's a great question. I think, you know, Sabine, it helps to have another person there with you that understands and holds space with you. Um, whether it's a counselor or, you know, somebody that you trust um, so that you don't feel that you're alone with yourself in this place. But your, 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 your deeper self is already speaking to you in your dreams, in your fantasies, in your thoughts with yourself. I think the problem can be that our thoughts can become OCD thoughts. They can be, you know, we have a thought and then we follow it, we chase it and it becomes another thought. It gets bigger and it grows and it gets bigger and grows. And then it becomes a narrative that becomes a belief system that we believe is the truth because it's a script running within our unconscious that we believe is the truth. And then that leads to behaviors. We start engaging with um, behaviors that are not good for us, with people who are not good for us, for ways of easing our pain that are not good for us. Um, 
But our, but our self is speaking to us all the time. And, and that's what dreams are doing. Dreams are messages from the psyche, from the soul. And a dream will show you where you're out of balance. Every character in a dream is an aspect of yourself, whether it be you know, male, female, animal, or whatever. And when you begin that dialogue, your, your, your psyche, your soul will be gentle with you. Like I'd rec like to recommend a book on, on this soul work that I talk about. It's um, Michael Moore's book, you know, Care of the Soul. It's a beautiful book about how we can gently care for our soul through poetry and music, being out in nature, you know, being in good company, good food, you know, all that kind of thing. So Care of the Soul, um, Soul Retrieval is another book by Sandra Ingerman about soul loss and retrieval. But yes, begin the conversation with your heart self slowly. Find people that you can trust to speak with and, you know, come to places like this where you can share with other people um, because we're all suffering. Every one of us, I'm suffering, Paul, so we all have something that's going on within us. I think in the past, there's been a lot of shame, um, particularly you know, when I was growing up um, and I'm delighted, you know, when I started training as a counselor, as a psychotherapist, people were ashamed for it to be known that they were coming to see me as a counselor or for psychotherapy nowadays. It's amazing. The young folk, the millennial folks saying, oh yeah, I might go to see my therapist. I go see my therapist. As somebody said recently, oh, I, I, I don't know if I'd, I'd, I'd trust that person. He said, they have never done any work on themselves. You know, so it's becoming now the thing to do and to, to be more open to that. And, and there's, there's less shame in, you know, acknowledging our vulnerability. And I certainly, what I found is that I, my strength is in my vulnerability. It's when I go to those places, I find my truth and my strength. So don't hide away on your own in there, you know, reach out. And, and if you want to email me on info at we can have a conversation about this um, later on in the week. Great, thanks for that question, Sabine. And uh, Finola is asking, um, she's saying great nuggets of wisdom. And she's asking what causes us to sabotage ourselves on this path? In a word or two, what emotions are unconscious locked emotions? cause us to sabotage ourselves mostly fear we're afraid of the unknown we're afraid of no, who we really are we're afraid that if we open up to heal that we find uh, memories um, feelings emotions that have been locked in there in the unconscious for good reason because there were too much to bear at the time and i noticed this on the shamanic course when people start to journey for sometimes of struggle and difficulty journeying because their psyche knows they're about to embark on a journey of self-discovery and that they will find something there that is looking to be healed. So when you get beyond the fear barrier, um, your psyche will be gentle with you. It'll only give you what you're able to bear. And particularly from, you know, when you look at what's going on in dreams and your fantasies, and particularly on shamanic, what I like about shamanic journeying is you can, you can take a journey anytime you want. You can record it and then listen back to yourself. And you'll hear your still small voice of your soul speaking to you from the other side so take a chance go for it because it believe me it's well worth taking that that um that journey that that path of self-discovery thanks finola for a good question um nina saying she enjoyed the conversation sabine thank you martin thank you for a lovely session sandy says thanks martin you're a legend see you in march Oh, beautiful. Looking forward to seeing you there, yeah, in Dunderry Park, yeah. I think we'll all agree that you are uh, definitely a legend, Martin. Um, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> well, legend in your own lifetime. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> just before, we have a few minutes to wind up, but I just wanted to ask you, because we always do this in our conversations, uh, a little bit on the whole psychedelic uh, area. If you want to, mm. uh, I have an event coming up actually on Wednesday with the last that, in, yeah. inward bound. Yeah, they do the psilocybin. Yeah. So we'll be on here again, folks, if you want to jump on there, a great bunch of guys. But Martin, you've got, always got some great things to say about psychedelics. And what role do you feel psychedelics can play at the moment? Uh, and you're right, they are a great bunch of guys you're going to have on Wednesday. I know, I know the, the Robin and, and um, Parsons, because they've, they've done some shamanic work at Dunderry Park. And what I like about what they have to say is, They've come and done their own personal work. They've, they've trained in the shamanic techniques. They've done holotropic breath work and they've prepared themselves to hold space. And that's what that is really important because with psychedelics, the, the, the key is, you know, the set and setting. 
the, the, you know, the state of frame of mind you're in before you take psychedelics, the setting you do it in, the dosage you take, and the people who are holding space for you. So that's why those lads uh, know what they're about. Now, psychedelics, um, as I said earlier, Groff called psychedelics non-specific amplifiers of the unconscious. He reckoned he likened psychedelics um, to um, to to, this, to to psychology and psychiatry. What the microscope was the science, in the sense that they bring everything up out of the unconscious and amplify it there and bring it to a catharsis and then. Um, heal it in the sense of expressing it and releasing it and let it go. As many people will say after one night of ayahuasca or a journey with psilocybin mushrooms, that they do more therapy in one night than they would in six months sitting in a one-to-one -one session. And, I, and, and that is true. But you must be careful because if you're going to take that much material up at one particular time, you better have somebody there to help you integrate it. I, I, a lot of my work in recent years have been people coming to me who took um, psychedelic trips um, in unsafe spaces with unsafe people and didn't get looked after afterwards. They weren't helped to integrate it and they came to see me for, to do some breath work or to do shamanic journeying to integrate. Like I had a lad the other night, 21 years of age, and he had a big, big psychedelic experience, blew him open. He saw into the nature of the universe. He was in touch with archetypal beings. He saw past life, stuff he never had thought about, stuff he wasn't ready for. And I've had a few sessions with him, a remarkable young man, by the way, 21 years old. As I said to him during the night, I wish I had your insights at 21 that you have. I don't even have them now. But the point I'm making is he was in crisis for a while because he hadn't taken care to do it properly. But done in the right set and setting with the right people, psychedelics are a powerful healing tool. And the, the shamans have been using sacred medicine for thousands and thousands of years in a very powerful, effective way. And I, would, I had the good fortune to um, experience um, ayahuasca with the shamans down in, in the Amazon in Ecuador. And I work with shamans with, with the mushroom in Mexico and in, in other, other spaces where I did it in, in a proper setting. And it was, it was a beautiful thing. And, and, and it was a scary, frightening, terrifying thing at times. I want to make that clear. It was no picnic in the park. But having said that, I, I learned one particular important lesson. The only way to get to heaven is through hell. And that's the truth of what I discovered. You will go down into the depths of your own psyche. They will bring you into your wounded place. They will bring it up and amplify it until you acknowledge it, release it, and let it go without judgment, because they teach you not to judge. And when you do that, then the energy will move from your base chakra to your mid chakra to your heart chakra. And a lot of healing happens in the heart chakra. And then you go to the, the higher chakras, and then it'll bring you to higher vibrational realms of light, of love, of healing, of compassion. And it'll show you It'll take you to the top of the mountain and it'll show you the promised land. And then it'll say to you, the, 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 the spirits of the medicine will say to you, now you've seen the, spirit, the, the promised land. You need to go back down the mountain and walk it at your own pace, in your own way, by doing your own work, whether it be therapy or healing or whatever you have to do. But some people make the mistake of when they get to the top of the mountain and seeing the promised land into the other worlds, whatever, they think, the, oh, I want to stay here forever. And, and then they, they, they artificially try to stay there. And that's what causes the harm. They go too far too fast. The metaphor I use for people often when they're using psychedelics is Icarus. Where he, they, you remember Icarus, the Greek myth, where they built these wings. And the father said to him, don't fly too close to the sun. And he disobeyed them and he did it. The wax melted and he crashed to the ground. That's the kind of thing I talk to people about psychedelics. Don't go too far too fast and crash. Do it gradually. Start off slow tr with trusted people. Um, you know, and the other side of it, of course, is the illegality of it. If you're doing a space where you're paranoid about, you know, there are people around who are doing legal work with psychedelics. And I see in Israel and in, in, in America and in Europe now, they're beginning to move towards legalizing psilocybin for depression, for example, or for anxiety. They're also looking at Ibogaine, um, which is from the Bwiti people in Africa, a root um, that has psychedelic properties for addiction. They're using MDMA for, for healing PTSD. 
cannabis is, as we know, being used for healing all sorts of physical ailments and also psychological and emotional ailments as well. But there are there are places that we opening up more and more where this can be done legally. And I think the mainstream is now beginning to recognize that these ancient uh, medicines have very much a lot of relevance in our modern times and perhaps they're needed now more than ever. But do it safely, folks. Do it legally if you can. Do it with people you trust and do it slowly and don't jump in at the deep end because you don't want to, you don't want to be you don't want to go, it's like what I say to people, it's like you plug yourself from, from 100 watts into a million watts and you just fry, you burn. And you may come out of it and find, say, Fuck, that was amazing, wow. Or you may come back and say, it may take you quite a while to get yourself back in your body and return to everyday normal reality. And so be mindful, be careful, and be safe. Great advice from a man who knows. Um, brilliant. Um, and I think now we've reached the point where we will... Um, finish off um, just a couple of things to say we've we, information on the course people know where to get that if they want to join in with Martin and uh, we will be giving a recording of this event on YouTube we'll post a link to everybody who's registered here today so if anybody missed it they'll see it on the replay or as Eileen is asking here there's a lot of information there so she'd like to watch it again so we will send it on to you Eileen the link uh, probably within 24 hours and uh, Brilliant. Um, more people saying thanks, Martin, and really appreciating the information today. Thank so thank you again. Before we leave, I'm just going to ask you all, we'll do a short meditation together again. And um, just to mention as well, as we were talking about, we'll have the event on Wednesday. I think it's 7.30. We're with the guys from Inward Bound. What I like about them is they've done the work. Uh, they know their stuff. They, they're similar to Martin. They don't say it's the be all and end all. They really ask you to approach it in a very, uh, you know, in a very um, professional way. And uh, tune in if you can on Wednesday. We'll post that event on Facebook and on our Facebook page and all that stuff. Okay. And uh, now we'll just drop in again. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and drop into your heart center. And just send uh, appreciation for any wisdom you received today or anything you felt within yourself that um, eased or shed some light for you. Um, just appreciation to yourself for anything that arose within you today that brought you to a more informed or better experience. So you're breathing into your heart center the energy of appreciation for self. Just get a sense of that space that Martin spoke about today, that inner aspect of ourselves, that inner strength, connection to soul. And just get a sense of the outer world just kind of drifting off and the inner world coming center stage and tuning to that powerful inner world. Get a sense of your own sovereignty. And now get a sense of all the people on this call, get a sense of them as a sovereign being doing what you're doing right now, connecting to their heart center and reach out and connect with all their hearts from your heart and send them all a little blast of appreciation for them and their role in the world right now.
Feel all the hearts connecting on the Zoom call. And now get a sense that we send all that out to humanity right now. And we hone in on the oneness of the human spirit. And we send it love, we send it appreciation. And we send it gratitude. Get a sense of the individual light of the human spirit, how powerful that light is. That it just blows everything out of the water. Feel that power, feel that strength in your own heart center. The integration of the human, the integration of the human and the divine. Feel that within you now. As you open your eyes and give thanks. Thank you. Wow, I felt like my parish priest there on a Sunday. What was going on there? <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> I, felt like I, got, I was channeling some preacher, I think. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang on with Martin here for a minute. Just going to have a little chat at the end. So I'm going to ask you all to leave whenever you're ready. Um, just to say goodbye to you all. Thank you so much for tuning in. Beautiful people. I really felt the connection there with you all. Thank you so much. Martin, would you like to say anything to people as they're heading off there? Thanks for tuning in, folks. It was lovely to meet you in this space. Um, I've been resisting it for a while, but I'm glad now that Paul invited me on here. Um, I really enjoyed it, and uh, thanks for tuning in. See you again. Bye for now.